want to invite you to begin by joining with me in the land acknowledgement. At the bottom right, you'll see placenames.mapdev.ca, which is a great website to help you. It's interactive to know where specifically you are joining us from, the correct Indigenous name for the village or town where you are located. Um, before I begin or as I begin, I also want to invite you to take this moment to uh, just connect to the land, um, ground yourself in gratitude, ground yourself in the Mi'kmaq land-based uh, values. Um, so perhaps there's a um, place where you feel especially connected to the land. It might be your garden, it might be the beach, it might be a hiking trail, it might be a park, but wherever you feel most connected to the land, maybe just take a moment to close your eyes and... Um, perhaps you would like to in your land acknowledgement as you're joining. So you might say something like, for example, I am acknowledging that I am speaking from Unamagi. Um, and you might say something like, uh, I'm so grateful for the way in which the sun is shining today in Unamagi. Or I um, just take a moment to reflect that gratitude for the land as you also acknowledge its name. Um, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking from Unamagi, which is located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, whose inherent rights were recognized in the peace and friendship treaties that were signed with the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples from 1725 to 1779. This series of treaties did not surrender indigenous land, resources, or sovereignty to the British Empire, but instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between nations. The treaties were later reaffirmed by Canada in Section 35 of the Constitution Act in 1982, and they remain active to this day. Let us take this time to pause in reflection and gratitude for the land where we live and work. And when we acknowledge the land, we must also begin to acknowledge the wisdom of this planet and align ourselves with its truths. So we pause in gratitude for this land and for all who have and continue to heroically care and advocate for this beautiful land. May we join them in this sacred work. Let us ground ourselves in the wisdom of the land-based Mi'kmaq teachings and values that we must all begin to learn. Let us work to decolonize ourselves, our practice in this community that we share by working for justice for all living beings as an expression of our gratitude for being here. And let us take a deep breath and recenter ourselves away from the violent ways colonization fills our world and fills us. Let us take a deep breath and work on letting go of the unconscious bias that is everywhere, inside and out. As we work on starting in a good way, may our session today lead us to be in right relationship with this land and with one another. We are all treaty people, so the question that we always want to be thinking about whenever we begin any professional development is how does this recognition impact what we do and how we do it, and how will it guide our work together today? The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action its 94 calls to action and includes several around health, education, as well as justice and child welfare, specific to um, who we are as social workers. So we wanna be thinking about what truth and reconciliation really means. Specifically, our statement of apology by the Canadian Association of Social Workers recognizes our role in um, supporting the implementation of residential schools and our need to focus on reconciliation. And that is a huge part of what is grounding our work today. And this uh, presentation is part of that. We, the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers, commits to translating our acknowledgement into action by seeking to implement the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, especially those regarding education. We commit to doing what we can to becoming better treaty partners. We commit to learning and to unlearning. And we commit to using our professional development to both learning new ways of thinking and understanding the work we do and unlearning assumptions and bias, which is specifically what we will be doing today and is in alignment with the new code of ethics 
that requires us to shift from neutrality, the illusion of that, to actively becoming anti-racist and fighting against racism and all intersectional prejudice that is part of colonization. So decolonizing is both a treaty responsibility, but it's also, we believe, a pathway towards a safer Mi'kma'ki for everyone. And as we recognize that there is a need for um, our province and all of us to align our policies with indigenous treaty rights, we take this moment to commit to using our professional development to think about how we can begin to unlearn so that we can be learning a new way forward. This is part of decolonizing and part of our commitment towards restorative practices. Decolonizing, we understand to mean healing intergenerational trauma and um, working to unite to fix the colonial systems and intergenerational trauma that we inherited, which is also the basis of just culture and safety principles, which I will be speaking more about today. We also recognize that becoming anti-racist is a journey from denying that exists to a sense of fear about avoidance to beginning to learn, to beginning to unlearn, which is part of the growth, to recognizing that we don't even know fully what it could look like to be in an anti-racist or non-racist world. And so that's where you can see that green arrow is shifting us um, but we don't even know where we're headed, but we know we want to be headed in that direction. Decolonizing ourselves and our practice means recognizing the ways in which we are each impacted by the colonial system in which we all participate and from which those of us of settler descent continue to benefit. Each of us, depending upon our social location and intersectional positionality, are uniquely impacted or oppressed. For example, those of us from African descent were dispossessed and uprooted from their land and brought to Turtle Island against their will as part of the white supremacy and slave trade that fueled the settlement of this continent. So we take this moment to reflect upon the unique impact of colonization upon each of us and upon our practice. And we think especially about um, intersectionality and um, the ways in which it is a lens through which we can see where power intersects and amplifies itself. And we are actually going to hear in a few moments, Kimberly Crenshaw, who developed this concept. Um, and we're going to hear her own definition of this, but it is part of our commitment to safer social work practice. So Kimberly Crenshaw um, is specifically focused on sharing, um, and she's going to be talking about it in the context of education. Um, as she defines intersectionality, which is the term that she invented. Um, but we reflect upon it, not just in terms of our learning, but also in terms of um, our practice of social work. So I'm actually just going to stop screen share for a second. Um, I just wanna make sure that I, um, oops, so make sure that I shared my sound, which, you know, it's, I'm being imperfect and that's a uh, part of, um, good social work practice is being willing to not worry if we um, are not perfect. What matters is that we're doing the best we can. And sometimes uh, that's part of it as we will also discuss. So here we are learning from Kimberly Crenshaw. Intersectionality is just a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood within conventional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. Intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory, it's a prism for understanding certain kinds of problems. African American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not just a race problem, it's not just a gender problem. So I encourage people to think about how the convergence of race stereotypes or gender stereotypes might actually play out in the classroom, between teachers and students, between students and other students, 
between students and administrators and commit themselves to understanding that as a way of intervening and providing equal educational opportunity for all students regardless of their identities. Identity isn't simply a self-contained unit, it is a relationship between people in history, people in communities, people in institutions. So schools do a good job when they understand that and when they commit themselves to curricular development, to opportunities in the school, for all students to understand the histories that have brought us to this particular moment. You can't change outcomes without understanding how they've come about. So independent schools can take the lead on that to be responsive to their student populations and to the communities out of which the students come. So that wonderful um, video is uh, has uh, Kimberly speaking a little bit about um, intersectionality and intersectionality is means that we all have different perspectives on intergenerational trauma and sometimes multiple coexisting and amplifying versions of it because colonial and intergenerational trauma looks different for different people but Trauma has similar characteristics for all of us, and most of us have some type of inherited intergenerational trauma. And policies that blame or shame us tend to have similar effects of shaming on us. Um, and healing requires people to feel safe. So these are some basic um, truths that we recognize. And when we think about just oppression and we think about uh, colonization, we think of um, what uh, the South African apartheid activist Stephen Biko said, which was the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And so we think of the role of the mind. And as I'm talking about the role of unconscious bias, there's also just the role of the internalization, um, that that is also something that he talks about. It's all part of how trauma affects us. So we all have inherited trauma. It's both intergenerational and it's also systemat systemically reinforced. So trauma affects the brain in all sorts of unique ways that affect our brain functioning. It can affect our hormones. It can affect the development of the brain. Early childhood of trauma, intergenerational trauma can cause epigenetic changes. And then we have different responses. So some uh, trauma theorists posit that there is, uh, we have a tendency towards fight or flight, which is what we often know where we fight or run away or avoid. But there's also freezing, which can mean dissociating or shutting down, um, flopping, which means sort of like just giving up physically, and then fawning, where we begin to identify with the oppressor or try to please the oppressor. Um, and that involves silencing and repressing oneself. And um, those other less known or discussed forms of trauma can have certain unconscious components to it. Um, but first, when we just think about trauma, it does impact our brain. So you can see here on the bottom left, two brain scans. One is the brain scan of a child that um, has not had any uh, significant trauma. And the other is the brain scan of a child that has had significant trauma um, from a, a Romanian orphanage. And you can see the differences in how the brain is functioning. So when someone says, well, just get over it, this is where the brain development causes some concrete changes and those neural pathways that children have as children, they continue to influence us. And when we've experienced trauma, we come to react to that in different ways. A trauma informed approach is about shifting from what's wrong with you or why can't you think differently to what's happening, why are you thinking this way? And then it also means shifting from a punitive, you did this wrong, to recognizing that people do the best they can with what they know or see or understand. And a restorative approach is about beginning to work on healing and justice, but in a way that is trauma-informed. It recognizes the role of the body and the brain 
on our physical systems, our hormones, on our, our immune system. It affects our cellular neurotransmitters. There's so many different physical impacts of trauma that we can see as well. So trauma can also affect our perception. And um, our perception is what shapes our decisions about how we respond to things and how we react. And it is uh, both external and internal. So our internal um, perception and our external perception tends to impact our decisions. And uh, that's true for lots of things, whether it's proprioception or vestibular or um, how we perceive or the things that we do in terms of our physical movements, but also as social workers, it'll affect us because trauma affects our perception. It also affects how we encode memories, the meaning we ascribe to them. Sometimes what happens is we encode memories and ascribe meanings maybe when I was five years old. Um, so for example, Dr. Gabor Matei talks about what happened to him when he was an infant and how his body and his memory encoded uh, trauma, early trauma, and it, he never really updated it until he was in his 60s and he went through some counseling to really begin to understand how that trauma that happened to him when he was young continues to impact him, not so much by that trauma as much, although that obviously had some somatic and biochemical and hormonal things, but also the meaning that we ascribed. He didn't update his meaning and the updating of the meaning was part of how he understood his healing to happen. But definitely trauma can influence influence our perception. And feeling safe in the current world will influence us. So if we're not feeling safe, we will have one reaction. If we are feeling safe, we tend to have another reaction. And that has certain survival components. So uh, our, we access different parts of our brain and different hormones, because maybe we do have to, our, our body has been wired to expect to need to run, to flee for survival. So the information, how we process it, um, is going to be impacted also by those larger structural dynamics that affect our feeling of safety. So we can see the role of perspective in um, what we do and how we do it. And we often talk about choice, um, but actually what we can see even in this brief start of this presentation is the role of um, a lot of structural influences and inherited intergenerational in issues to create certain aspects within ourself that will also inform how we perceive things. And so how we look at the world, how we perceive things is also very much influenced by um, trauma as well. So the question for us as social workers and as humans is to think about well, what beliefs do we carry? Where did we learn them? How accurate are they? What is our intersectional lens? What impacts our perception? Are the lenses that we're bringing to a specific situation, are they informing them in such a way that is accurate? Is it related to our lived experience? If we're having a strong emotion, how much of that strong emotion is related to the current situation and how much might be related to other memories that we have stored inside of us that we may or may not even be fully aware of because of the role of trauma. We're also immersed in colonial bias, systemic racism, and intersectional structurally bias and trauma. And um, in the same way as fish doesn't know it that they're in water, um, so too, we are so immersed in certain systemic biases that we may not even understand, for example, our privilege and what we um, live with and how that informs us or impacts us. And that's not even talking about vicarious trauma, um, the work that happens as social workers, where we often accompany people during the most challenging, messy, and traumatizing moments of their life. And um, this quote by Dr. Naomi Raman, the ex it always speaks to me about that. The expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. So 
that is true in terms of the systemic bias that we live in, as well as the vicarious trauma that we encounter and potentially the experiences we may have had growing up if we grew up in traumatic experiences or environments. All of those things influence us no less than putting a sponge in water will make it wet. And that's one of the reasons why we require minimum of two hours of vicarious trauma professional development, specifically to ensure that um, the trauma that we're observing or immersed in doesn't impact us in ways that cause us harm. So all this is part of thinking about the role of the unconscious. And as social workers, we've tended to focus a lot on the external, on for very good reasons, on systemic injustice. But trauma really is about looking at the unconscious. Now, we have tended to go away from it because when we think of the unconscious, sometimes we might be inclined to think of Freud. And Freud, you know, he certainly developed this concept or made it a little more well known, but he also brought with him his own set of biases and assumptions um, and an approach to uh, therapy that not everyone aligns with. Um, but it's still important to understand the role of the unconscious because it continues to influence us, not necessarily in the exact ways that Freud um, understood, although some of you might be Freudians and uh, agree that, but whatever we understand in terms of the unconscious, it, it is related to sort of those, um, those automatic responses. Um, so when I say like, what is in a name? If we call a rose by any other name, it would smell as sweet. The role of the unconscious is certainly a huge part of it. But we have not tended to do it because our medical system is, uh, it's harder to study the unconscious. So if we're focused on evidence-based care, we tend to focus on things that are evident or visible. And studying the unconscious is not impossible, but it is more difficult than studying that which is visible. And because evidence-based care is also connected to um, for example, the pharmaceutical industry that might uh, be funding some research and funding uh, potentially the positions of uh, certain people who might be on peer review journals or just the, the complexity of that. Um, it's it, it, We don't see as much research on the unconscious as well. Um, we might see more research on um, therapies that can be uh, well integrated with uh, pharmaceutical interventions for anxiety or depression, for example. And we see the, the medical model talking about disease or pathology around anxiety or depression, as opposed to thinking about intergenerational trauma, as opposed to thinking about the role of systemic injustice and trauma on the way we um, experience the world. So while um, Freud, you know, talks about defense mechanisms, and we will talk about it. And he highlights the difference between repression and suppression. So suppression is where you consciously push something out of awareness, where you're like, yes, this happened, but that was in the past, and I'm not going to think about it. Repression tends to happen unconsciously and automatically. So internal family systems is another method. There are many, many different methods and trauma and somatic therapies in particular, somatic therapies are really great at thinking about how um, uh, trauma is stored in the body. The body keeps the scores. Um, one book that uh, talks about that. Internal family systems is another wonderful methodology to thinking about trauma. Um, and it looks at the core self and then it looks at how we have different parts that react, like our inner kid that maybe learned to be a manager, learned to take care of other people. For social workers and healthcare providers, we tend to have um, managers that are like, I'm going to plan, I'm going to caretake, I'm going to take care of things, or firefighters, I'm going to um, maybe uh, react and try to like, stop myself from feeling overwhelmed by numbing out. Maybe that's where addictive behaviors happens. Um, and then there's the exiles. Those are the parts of us that um, have been hurt or wounded that hold trauma and pain that are sometimes exiled into the unconscious. 
um, or they're, they're shut away is really more the language. So there are different words for talking about the role of the unconscious. But what we can see is that the unconscious is maybe a little bit like muscle memory where certain things get in encoded and it's meant from a survival perspective so that they can become automatic. Um, it can be adaptive, except that sometimes it's not. And that's what we're going to be talking about today when we talk about unconscious bias. Um, you know, in the same way as driving a bike or riding a bike, you might automatically learn to veer to the left if you hit a rock on the road. So too, we might, our unconscious might have learned, for example, if um, I'm interacting with someone and they take on a certain tone that reminds me of a, a family member that traumatized me, I might learn to adopt a certain behaviors and I might do it almost unconsciously like muscle memory. So that's sort of the, the idea that, for example, internal family systems might talk about. When we think about trauma, there's the personal and there's collective and um, recognizing that a lot of it happens not in the conscious mind um, and thinking about what separates the conscious mind from the unconscious mind. Increasingly, theorists are talking about the role of shame as that which keeps us from accessing our unconscious. So shame is a huge, um, almost like wall in this image. Um, it's what separates us from the parts of us that are hurting. Um, and it can, a variety of different pro projections are, is one me defense mechanism that some people might call about. Um, strategies, coping. So perfectionism is another one. I'm going to just try to be as perfect as I can. And certainly colonization has taught us about perfectionism as an ideal. Um, and unfortunately, it we it's reinforced by the way we if we make a mistake in our systems, whether it's in healthcare or in society at large, we are often punished. And punishment is a big business. And in the states, prisons are privatized. And in fact, there's even an amendment in the Constitution to ensure that slavery um, is continued in um, in prisons in the United States. So um, we can see how the economic system reinforces a punitive culture and it is part of colonization. But punishment teaches us to hide. And if we were already traumatized and we learn to hide early, then that actually amplifies the cycle of shame. And the more we are punished or told that we're doing something wrong, the more we hide, the more we have shame, the more that trauma feels worse, and it becomes a, an escalating cycle. And uh, intersectional oppression and intersectional trauma can amplify that as well. And uh, a lot of different uh, defense mechanisms can happen from projecting onto others, unacceptable feelings to displacement. There's this is, these are really from the psychodynamic perspective, which is a different topic. We may be looking at decolonizing psychodynamic uh, principles as an upcoming lunch and learn. Let me know if you are interested. Um, but thinking about the ways in which, for example, reaction formation. So, for example, it's been suggested that a lot of times people who are transphobic are um, actually have reaction formation. And a lot of people who um, were transphobic and came out of the closet talk about how they had their own sort of reaction formation. If you had a chance to hear, um, we had uh, Ian who was talking a little bit about his experiences actually leading conversion therapy practices. And I say conversion therapy in quotation marks because it's uh, actually incredibly harmful and damaging, but how he was doing that in part because um, through religion and adverse religious experiences, he thought that that was the way to stay safe. And then when he came out, he realized the, the harm that he did. So that was a lunch and learn that we did in December on the topic. It was a first voice perspective. Um, but that's an example of reaction formation. And that is one example of uh, how the unconscious sometimes might uh, cause us to for example, sublimation is maybe like, I'm really, really angry at the uh, injustice that I experienced. I'm going to sublimate that through advocacy. Now, that's a healthy potential um, outlet uh, for that unconscious trauma and pain and anger. Um, some of these, as I described earlier, are less helpful. So all that as if though this world was not hard enough to decipher. 
So I'm talking about perception and how the unconscious influences our perception. And the world is already hard enough to figure out anyways. So if you're looking at this visual, for example, we all have different ways of seeing things in general. So perhaps you're looking at this and you see a rabbit. Perhaps you're looking at this and you see a duck. How many of you can see both? How many of you can see both simultaneously, the capacity to hold two different perspectives simultaneously without having cognitive dissonance and anxiety is its own um, challenge and opportunity. And that's really where the binary approach of colonization that tells us to go either or um, reinforces that. And that's where, for example, if you, um, for example, are familiar with dialectical behavioral therapy for uh, trauma or what uh, some people call BPD, borderline personality disorder, which is probably just a form of trauma, um, but that is a whole theoretical debate to have. Um, but one of the methods is to try to learn to cope to seemingly conflicting opinions simultaneously and doing some self-regulation and breathing to be able to restructure how we think of things. So this is an exercise that can help us do that. You might see the beak over here. You might see the eye and the nose of the rabbit here or the beak of the duck there, depending on which direction you look. Um, this is an example of how the unconscious um, functions. That is separate from the larger structural influences that uh, inform our thinking, that create both explicit and implicit bias. Um, and uh, the associations that we have, a lot of them are reinforced. Even if there are explicit biases, they're reinforced by implicit biases. Um, so they affect our perceptions, but they also affect our willingness to support adhere to and vote for and fund certain policies or that might reinforce uh, the status quo that leads to potentially in inequitable outcomes and racial disparities. So we can see how uh, the role of biases in all of these. So there are both explicit biases and implicit biases. Explicit are when you're aware of the thoughts or feelings, maybe towards specific groups. Um, implicit is more of uh, unconscious, like a gut reaction, um, uh, sort of without thinking kind of thing. Like when you're driving a bicycle and you hit a stone and you automatically adjust to correct, you may not be aware. Um, and those are the implicit biases. So it's really important from an ethical perspective to be aware of the role of unconscious bias. And that's why um, the session can count towards your ethics requirement, um, is because it really is part of ensuring safer social work practice, especially with the new code of ethics that just came out. Um, so the Canadian Association of Social Workers talks about multiple values. They're not radically different than what we already had. They're however, much more focused on shifting from the illusion of neutrality to actively working to dismantle systemic bias externally and internally, so that we can focus on the values of respecting the dignity and worth of every single person, um, promoting social justice, pursuing truth and reconciliation. And so all of these involve becoming aware of our own um, internalized racism, internalized uh, structural in bias, um, and then also focused on valuing human relationships, valuing our relationships more broadly. That's um, something that I know specifically uh, as a, with a decolonizing lens, having a non-species approach, but to recognize all relationships with all living beings and all of creation. Um, is something that uh, in our consultations as we take the CSW Code of Ethics and translate it to our own that we're looking at. But all of this is part of preserving integrity and professional practice and uh, maintaining privacy and the ways we provide care, um, providing competent, uh, culturally safe uh, or safer services. And we talk about safer, recognizing that safety is not necessarily achievable, but it's a journey towards. Um, and many system factors inform our perceptions and our biases, and many systemic factors reinforce them. Um, and there are ethical implications to all of them, and a lot of it has to do with how we manage our biases. Um, but then finances and other things will also affect that. 
So the first step to uh, addressing unconscious bias is acknowledging that they exist. So that's step number one. How do we begin to unlearn? We have to become aware of them. So you may or may not be familiar with uh, the Project Implicit. It comes from Harvard um, and it, uh, it, it has, as well as a couple of other universities. Um, and it, it used to be called Project Implicit Mental Health. Um, and it's an association test that you can take on a variety of different kinds of biases. There's racism here is the one I visualized, but there are many different ones. And it's one way to become self-aware. But of course, there are many ways. Being able to hear difficult feedback from others, non-defensively, but to simply hear it is another way. Uh, but it's important to know that bias is a little different than prejudice. Um, bias can be both positive and negative. Um, whereas prejudice is very negative. Um, and, but both will result in unfairness or differences. Um, and then there's conscious versus unconscious. So conscious has chosen. If you know better, you do better. Unconscious, for example, is not necessarily even being aware. So I didn't know that when I use this term, it can be offensive, for example. And uh, when we're talking about biases, I want to bring us back to this particular visual, which talks about the role of fear. So what are we actually afraid of when we're talking about this? We're afraid of maybe doing things wrong. We're afraid of what we don't know. We're afraid of maybe being ashamed if we don't know something or ashamed of our role in perpetuating and complicity. Um, so fear does play a significant role um, in uh, maintaining the racist status quo is what increasingly a lot of uh, theorists are informing us. And so addressing fear is important to addressing unconscious bias and understanding unconscious bias, understanding systemic ones and feeling comfortable leaving our comfort zone and checking ourselves and thinking about which ones happen automatically, which ones are based on conditioning. Um, so in, in becoming self-aware is very important. And there are lots of different kinds of biases um, that we have. So for example, availability bias. So when, uh, for example, uh, there's uh, maybe people are doing a feedback session and they, I'm just going to just pull the people in my neighborhood. Well, that's a bias, right? Because the people in your neighborhood are not necessarily reflective of everyone. So that's an availability bias, for example. There are lots of different kinds of biases. There's affinity bias, for example. I might have a preference for people who are similar to me or who have similar qualities than me. Or confirmation bias. I look for the information that supports my beliefs and I might not look for the stuff that goes against it because there's so many different types of biases. So becoming aware of the risk of, our, of the different kinds of biases that helps us recognize when one of these might show up and take countering measures to reduce harm or risk. So for example, I identify as transgender. I might be more prone to be like, oh, well, you also identify as transgender. We must share similar qualities that may or may not help me be able to relate to that person. It might actually cause me not to see them clearly because I focus on confirmation bias. I only see or pay attention to the things that resonate with my own beliefs. And it might cause me to not see or perceive clearly somebody who isn't like me. So that's an example of, oh, well, I know that I might have this risk of a bias because we share certain commonalities that could potentially cause me not to see them quite as clearly. So that's an example of an approach to bias that we don't normally talk about when we think about bias, but um, it does, it can also lead to error. So when we see that there's an error based upon our unique intersectional identity and who we are, for example, and where we are located on the different intersectional wheel of power and privilege, we might want to do like a peer check. So this is used in, in uh, the medical world. Uh, for example, no one's perfect. Um, so sometimes when there's a complicated uh, medical, like they're, they're counting pills, they'll be like, hey, can you peer check me? Make sure that I counted this right. 
well, how do we take that and say, okay, maybe I need peer supervision when working with this service user because I know that this person either reminds me of me or is or reminds me of my parent or reminds me of my child or reminds me of the person who traumatized me or whatever it is. And recognizing that means that I have the potential to potentially have some unconscious bias that could factor in how I'm perceiving them versus how what they're bringing up in me that may or may not be fully conscious and just recognizing that. And that's where we might want to ask for help, seek out supervision, be extra proactive, um, learning more. And it's also about thinking about what we do or don't know. So for example, I am white presenting. I don't know what it's like to not be white presenting. That means that when I think about my professional development selection, I should be thinking about whose voices do I learn from that are different than mine because I don't know what I don't know. On the other hand, I, for example, identify as transgender. So I um, know more than I could ever want to know um, about gender and diversity, diversity around gender. And I am traumatized on a daily basis because of that in ways that no one who's not transgender fully ever will understand. And so that feeling of being isolated and alone and no one understands my lived experience, they don't know what it's like to be afraid to go to the bathroom, they don't know what it's like to be disowned by your family, they don't know what it's like to be disowned by your religious community, they don't know what it's like to be assaulted just for walking down the street. So that those are the things, that's vicarious trauma, that's not just vicarious trauma, that's my personal trauma that could impact Maybe it would be hard for me to in, in, interact with someone who presents in a way that seems cisgendered and super privileged, and I need to address that trauma so it doesn't cause a bias that could impact my ability to be fully present with someone else who may have their own traumas, their own unique challenges that I might not fully understand or perceive clearly if I'm so focused on my own that I can't see them for who they are. So these are the two risks that happen. Um, and then as social workers, we have to think about our professional development selection, our plan for safer care, um, seeking out supervision, walk, wanting to make sure that we don't unintentionally bring ourselves into things. And that's separate from burnout, which we live in a world with a million reasons to be burnt out. And if you've already uh, listened to my YouTube um, on burnout, it is a very common thing. That's certainly my doctoral research. So I have a big passion about it. But whether it's work, whether it's culture, whether it's family, whether it's just managing the different things, whether it's the environmental challenges, there's a million reasons why these are just a few, uh, why we might be burnt out. Um, but that also can cause us to be less focused, less present, and more prone to letting the unconscious drive us. And when we make decisions, we make decisions either through intuition or instinct. And some research suggests that most of the time, it's instinct and intuition. It's unconscious. It's fast. It's associative. It's on automatic pilot based on personal background, cultural experiences, previous experiences, our own identities, and rarely is it fully rational, conscious. And so from an ethical practice perspective, that presents a safety risk. So safer social work means being self-aware, recognizing our potential risks in the way we function and the ways in which we perceive the world. And looking at the many, many different kinds of biases and beginning to understand. So I talked about affinity bias. I talked about confirmation bias. There's the halo effect. I project positive qualities onto people without actually knowing them. Oh, people who are X, they always do Y. I love them. You're so wonderful. Perception biases. So some of those are just the stereotypes. But there's ageism. There's maternal biases. Oh, if you're a mother, you've got to be kind. There's uh likability bias, there's um, beauty bias, people who are considered more tr traditionally beautiful uh, tend to have higher pay rates, for example, there's gender bias, ageism, there's a million different types of biases and becoming aware of all of those different potentials is so important for safer social work practice. So what does this mean for us? 
as people trying to make it through this really scary, confusing world with on top of it, it's not enough to be thinking about all the stuff that's out there, but what about all the stuff that's inside of us? Well, it means recognizing that we're all human. We all have vulnerabilities and our ethical responsibility is to recognize where our risks for harm might lie and to begin to develop safety plans. Um, so that we can reduce the risk of bias and stigma causing harm. It means being aware of our positionality in each of these different ways, whether it's around geography, ethnicity, education, ability, culture, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, race, marital status, language, indigeneity, income, immigration status, these are just some of the many, many different types. Um, and this is part of ethics and becoming aware of implicit bias as an ethical mandate, which is what our new code of ethics is causing us to do. And what we at our upcoming conference, um, May 24th and May 25th, our annual conference, we're going to be really focusing upon unconscious bias as a core part of ensuring safer social work practice. Um, and it's part of this move, recognizing that we may not ever get to safe um, with no danger because we live in a world where there's so much lack of safety, but we can certainly work towards that. We shouldn't just give up and flop and be like, well, there's no point. Um, we can always be working towards safer social work practice and coming up with safety plans based upon our own self-awareness of where we lie. And that's the conference that we're hoping that we're going to be doing. Um, but the first order of business ultimately is about how do we decolonize the mind? If you're not familiar with Dr. Michael Yellowbird, who leads the social work, um, I think at the University of Manitoba, if I'm not mistaken, um, he talks about neuro decolonization and the ways in which colonial beliefs issues around perfectionism, binary, punitive, shaming, trauma, all of these things are part of our psyche. And decolonizing is recognizing that it's not about an individual, but it's about the system that indoctrinated each and every one of us. And um, the fear of being blamed sometimes can maintain the status quo. Um, and the blame and shame culture keeps us from wanting to speak out sometimes, which is why our conference is going to be focused on how can we begin to speak out in ways that are not blaming, in ways that are not shaming, but in ways that can help us begin to heal and learn together. And that is part of unlearning the power of perfectionism that continues to haunt so many of us, continues to amplify the trauma continues to cause a lot of shame. So just culture is one approach. It's um, evidence-based. It's uh, used across Turtle Island. It's an approach to healthcare. It's not yet um, been well integrated into social work theory, but that's what we are trying to begin to do. And just culture is about looking at, instead of punishing when a mistake happens, um, but looking at, well, what can we learn from why this mistake happened and how can we create safer practices? Um, so instead of punishing, which causes people to lie, avoid, not take ownership for their part, um, but instead, in fact, if you go to many hospitals that adopt just culture, when um, someone spots a mistake or someone spots, there's like a good catch, a safety catch, and it's celebrated, celebrating that, oh, you you almost gave that person the wrong mis medicine, but you caught yourself because you did a peer check. How wonderful that is. What if we treated racism and bias like a medical error that could cause harm? Because it can cause harm. Just uh, we don't treat it with the same degree of severity and yet it can cause profound harm, worse harm, in fact, than medical errors, because it's the ultimate medical error. It's the reason why there's different health care disparities between people of one race and another, between people of one socioeconomic background and another, one gender and another. 
that this is actually the ultimate medical error is the failure to address systemic racism and the ways in which colonization is haunting us all. What if we treated it the same? Um, colonial systems blame and punish the individual, whereas a just culture addresses the system that enabled the mistake. So there's uh, there's a lot of wonderful research on just culture versus blame culture, um, which and then no blame culture, which is step one, no blame. Okay, let's you know recognize that the system is there, and then just culture is working towards safer and braver care. Is like saying, hey look at this safety catch, let's celebrate that, let's learn from it, let's do a deeper mistake. Why did I say that thing that I might have caused you harm? I um, might have used a word that is harmful and is, um, you know, I absorbed it from the unconscious and I used a negative stereotypical word, for example, or and when someone misgenders me, which happens all the time. So sometimes people misgender me and it's accidental. Sometimes it feels very intentional. Either way, that happens because we live in a society where people are not used to they pronouns yet. And I say yet. Um, so just culture is about safer and braver. Um, we have systemat systemic understandings of safety when it comes to certain things. So, for example, if you go to the gas station, there's a different anyone could possibly make a mistake between the gas and the diesel. So they're shaped differently because they know it could possibly happen. Similarly, if you go to the ATM. So many people leave their bank cards inside of the banking machine. So you can't get your money until you take out your your um, your system, your uh, card. Why don't we have a similar approach of being proactive, recognizing here's the systemic harms that have caused tremendous harm to people for generations? How can we create systemic protective factors to prevent that? So, for example, putting the my my pronouns on my um, Zoom screen is my way of trying to be like, hey, by the way, you might be tempted to use a different pronoun for me. This is a visible reminder. That's me trying to create a sort of systemic response proactive to help people not to cause me harm. Um, that's true that I can do that for gender, but what? how can we begin to think about creating a safer world for all of us? This approach to safety culture is um, used very frequently in the medical world, and it, it calls a, it involves a reporting culture where people feel safe to report errors and near misses. It involves a just culture, which is an atmosphere of trust in which people are encouraged or rewarded for talking about this. A learning culture, flexible, informed, studying, all of these are part of a safer culture. Safer for, for the people working there, translates into safer for the people receiving care. If we are not feeling safe where we work, then we sometimes unconsciously bring that lack of safety into the ways in which we provide care for others. And so the just culture has certain principles that are actually incredibly similar to a more decolonizing lens involving flattening higher keys, listening to all people. So safety huddles, when they're done properly, involve everyone, whether it's the chief, uh, the chief neurosurgeon or the person that's cleaning the floors or the patient, everyone has a perspective that can be contributed and embracing those different perspectives together and being able to think about doing things differently. Transparency is a huge part of safety. How do we talk about things openly? How do we investigate all of these things are part of this approach that helps us go from unconscious to conscious to how can we, when we become more aware and we put in different systemic protections, it's sort of the Swiss cheese model. We are familiar with it because we saw this when we were looking at uh, COVID. There, a lot of people started talking about Swiss cheese. So you can't protect against COVID just with a mask, but the mask, the hand washing, the social distancing, that was a Swiss cheese model for safety during COVID. What kind of Swiss cheese model can we look at in terms of diversity and inclusion to think about how can we be reinforcing to create safer practices to address the fact that unconscious bias is everywhere, no less than the sponges in water and the fishes in water and doesn't even know that it's in water.
So we want to look at it proactively before it occurs. We all have bias, recognizing that we all have bias based on my life experience and intersectionality, which biases might I be more prone to, which biases might I be less prone to. And then what happens if we do make a mistake or if we unintentionally commit a microaggression? Do we avoid it? No, 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 I didn't say that. You misunderstood me. Do we, are we afraid of shame? Do we lie? Do we pretend? Do we attack? No, you said it wrong first. No, it was his fault or something like that. Or do we say, wow, I did that. I wonder, I'm so sorry. And like, what can I learn from that so it doesn't happen again? How can we look at that restorative approach? Um, a lot of research talks about, this is one, uh, research on team communication. It's super common that we bring our own trauma and the trauma that we work in, and it affects team communication, how we work with each other. Um, and we see that this is very, very common in healthcare, and it can contribute also to patient care problems because I might be less likely to go and ask a team member for help if I don't feel safe around them. And that might inf- Form the safety of the patient. So looking at the safety, it has to be safe everywhere. We can't just bottleneck the safety and be like, I'm just going to focus on safety here. It has to be internal. It has to be interpersonal. It has to be structural and it has to be all over. And it, if we do that, it even has financial benefits. It is less likely to have people, we have to work in our advocacy to understand that it's, diversity and equity isn't just quote unquote, about being nice, but it even is going to reduce some of the issues in terms of like how many people are going on leave and burnt out. Um, It's a harm reduction approach. And it involves also when we do encounter things that are not safe, how do we respond? Do we blame and shame? How dare you do this? Um, Because that may, as we said, increase shame. So it's looking at, for example, calling in or calling out. So calling in is when you talk to someone in a way that's like, hey, you may not realize you said this um, and it caused me some harm. Calling out is maybe, for example, if that's not possible or they're not listening or it might cause harm to large people. This is where you might potentially want to be making a report to uh, a professional body if you are aware of a professional, whether it's your colleague or someone else, um, to prevent harm to other people. Um, So looking at how to make that assessment, how to do it in a way that prevents harm to you, um, how to do it in a way that prevents harm to others, we're still figuring this all out. Um, And uh, if you are interested in being part of our professional standards and ethics committee or education committee or social justice committee or decolonizing committee, we're trying to figure these out. Um, But there are different approaches, whether it's calling out or calling in. Increasingly, there's also this idea of calling up to a higher purpose, like our code of ethics, for example. Um, And how do we do it? Do we say, wow, I need you to stop. That's causing me some pain. Um, Or do we say, how dare you? Um, Calling in. I'm curious. What was your intention when you said what you said? Um, How might somebody else hear what you just said? So here, there's a couple of different um, resources. Uh, Again, if you want to see this PowerPoint, I'm happy to um, send it to you. Um, But the question is, how do we make decisions about how we speak about, how do we interrupt bias? How do we use eye language and do it? How do we do it in a trauma-informed and shame-informed way? And then what if we are the ones being called out? How do we take a deep breath? How do we say, okay, I was taught by colonization to be embarrassed, afraid of punishment, but we are all decolonizing. The only way we can get to a safer world is by recognizing each of us have a role in it in one way or another. So if I, because of my intersectionality, don't know how someone from a different intersectionality is experiencing me, I need to take a deep breath and be like, well, which part? Lots of different approaches. Um, So here's three. There's the claim method, centering yourself. You're not being attacked, listening, acknowledging, apologizing, inquiring if they have time. If not, just doing your own inquiry, moving forward. That's one approach. 
Another approach is the comfort stretch panic zone, where we feel confident to engage in conversations about what we know about, where we stretch, we're less comfortable, how far are we stretching? Are we anxious? How can we begin to address that anxiety? How do we look? Um, there's also this other nonviolent communication model. Um, this is another method, observing without judgment. Okay, now you've called my attention to it. I'm going to just, uh, you know, I might not, I might say, wow, I, I never occurred to me. I'm going to have to think about what you're saying. I don't want my first reaction to be the reaction that like I'm having a reaction of like, I want to respond and defend myself, but I know that's a colonial reaction. I need to take a few moments and think about it. Can I come back to you next week and reflect on it? Um, feeling without thoughts, which feelings are related to what? If I'm having a really strong feeling, it might be disproportionate to the situation. So what is being triggered inside of me? I have to do my own, whether it's supervision or journaling or walking or talking it out with a friend. So those are just some of them. Um, we, our professional standards committee, our social justice committee have been talking about how do we create um, guidelines for how to how to call people in, how to call people out, how to respond. What does this look like? We're still figuring it out. Um, and uh, this is a larger process, but it has to be. If our code of ethics is calling us to do it, we just have to look at the statistics of the current status quo and the disproportionate um, inequity that is everywhere and the increasing violence and harm to know we have to find a way to breathe. Exhale at colonial shame and embrace the learning opportunity because there's no failures if we keep learning and growing, then it's only lessons learned. But that is a that sentence is not something we were most of us raised with. We were learned, oh my gosh, if I make a mistake, I'm going to fail, right? But we've all inherited a system that causes harm a system that has bias built into it. And we all have intergenerational trauma of one kind or another, blame and shame that is therefore activated. And unfortunately, right now we focus on people instead of the system whenever there's a mistake. So a safety culture and a just culture is about shifting from a culture of blame to a culture of accountability, recognizing that it's not people who are the problem, but that it's the system focusing not on who is wrong, but what is wrong in the process. And then looking at um, many alternatives. It's never either or. That's a binary colonial concept. And how can we work together to co-create a safer environment? There are multiple beliefs that are part of safety culture, that are part of just culture, that are part of colonialism that are part of the, that impact us, right? So colonization, as well as unsafe culture, focusing on perfectionism, a sense of urgency, so that we're not thinking with our most calm and collected mind, but rather a more emotive, reactive mind that causes us to be defensive. We live in a world that focuses on quantity over quality, which reinforces urgency, which is why rest is resistance. Worship of the written word, the only one right way, there's only one way, the individualism, the fear of conflict that keeps us, of open conflict that keeps us from transparency and learning, power hoarding, either or, um, progress is bigger, better, more, the idea that the objectivity even exists. Um, these are just some of the strategies that create shame and complicity. And the vicious cycle of perfectionism actually affects that depression. Well, why give up? And it actually informs the burnout process. And so trying to recalibrate and learn and be aware that we're all going to make mistakes and to almost celebrate that. Look, I'm making a mistake. That helps other people feel safe. When we talk about it, we model that the mistakes don't have to destroy us. That's part of the safer culture. That's part of unlearning assumptions. That's and then talking about intersectionality, recognizing the ways in which that influences us and how we can work on repairing harm to create more restorative processes. This is part of what it means. And we want to be thinking about doing that on an internal level, on an interpersonal level, 
and then on an external level, our relationships with each other, and then looking at all of this, what does all of this mean in terms of unconscious bias in the ways in which our systems are constructed, who gets to have input in it? This is one of the reasons why we are advocating for first voices to be part of every step of a decision-making process, because you don't know what you don't know, right? That was the whole issue with the the schools that were locking the gender neutral bathrooms because they were afraid kids were smoking in it. Both valid concerns, certainly, but uh, they didn't know that they, by doing locking it, they were causing profound damage and harm. So being able to be open and say, oh, it never occurred to me. Well, that's why you want someone with first voice lived experience of every intersectionality, someone from this intersection and that intersection. We all have different perspectives. This is also part of our approach to professional development um, and this collaborative interprofessional approach. You may know we're going to be having on Thursday, one on heart disease um, to bring together multiple different perspectives because we there's also professional bias, right? A doctor might be more prone to look at the biomedical approach and not think about the social work approach or the chaplaincy approach or the occupational therapy approach or the recreation therapy approach or the physical therapy approach or the psychology approach. All of these are part of a larger whole and we safer care involves recognizing professional biases because of our training and positionality because um, the system has us sometimes pit against each other, like there's the biomedical, and then you sometimes get one quote unquote allied health provider there for everything when we each have unique perspectives. So how do we work together? How do we make referrals to each other? What does that commitment to safer practice look like in terms of our professional development learning so that we privilege okay, uh, based upon my positionality, I might be more prone to unconscious bias in this area. So I need to look at either prevention of my own distress and trauma or uh, advocacy or learning about people's experiences that are different than mine. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to remind you about May 10th, um, which is the we're going to be having uh, Dr. Fiery Jean Gravelin, who's going to be talking about first voices. Um, and that's an important part of unlearning bias. Um, in fact, our conference is going to be specifically focused on uh, how do we listen to first voices? We're going to have, in, instead of a keynote, this is kind of like a decentralized keynote about first voices by someone who helped to really emphasize and develop this concept within the social work profession. Um, using her own Indigenous lived experience. Um, but this notion of why a keynote, why is one voice more important than others? So um, at our conference, we're going to be celebrating the courage of our members. We're going to have several members who are going to be speaking about their own lived experiences based on their own intersectional identities and positionalities and what that informs them about unconscious bias, about safer social work, about speaking out, about being braver. And then we are each going to have opportunities to talk with each other and do self-reflection with various activities to build community with each other to, to begin talking about how do we unlearn. And this is actually going to help us be almost like an informal focus group for the new professional development requirements that we're going to spend the summer working on for our professional development committee um, as we work on create, how do we take the new code of ethics and translate them into safer care, looking at specifically our positionality and our risk of bias and harm. Um, if you're interested in serving on any of these committees or getting more involved in any of this stuff and really shaping the future of the social work profession here at Beautiful and Seated Nikmagi, um, I welcome your participation, would love to have you. Uh, so feel free to contact me. And with that, I am going to stop my screen share um, look at any questions you might have. I know that I went over, but since this is being uh, recorded, it's uh, it, you can still watch it. Um, so I'm going to just see if there are any other questions that might have come up. Um, I see lots of awesome comments. I don't think so. So if you're watching us on uh, YouTube, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully at the conference. And um, thank you for everything you do every day to make our world safer and better.